um, people don't want to answer. Oh, didn't, no. Okay, now we have 16 votes. Good. All right. So, uh, which and which method should you save user uh, edit? So the the home reading talked about the life cycles of activities, and um, <coughs> so uh, it just said what happens in each of those methods. On pause gets called when, for whatever reason, your activity loses control. And that would indeed be good space to save user edits. Um, <coughs> so uh, on stop gets called when? I don't know. Um, when? I see. So that so on stop gets called when for whatever reason another activity uh, gets replaces yours. One example that might happen is the user goes to the home screen and fires up another activity. So even the user going to the home screen would stop your activity. Um, and on destroy uh, happens, of course, when your activity for whatever reason gets destroyed. For example, because the device is low in memory. So it's very different from s uh, programming, say, a Windows application where you would never worry about losing control or uh, having your application kicked out. <coughs> and here you just do have to, to worry about that. Um, and we'll, when, when we do some, some of the projects, then we'll get into these a little bit more. All right. And so what happens when the user hits um, the back button? Let's see what you guys think is happening. OK. So the majority answer is. Yes, and so the majority of you have the correct answer. Um, when you hit the back button, there's a stack of activities, and that's just a stack of whatever activities happened on your device. They don't have to be just within uh, within your application. And so if you, your activity might have gained control because some other activity called it, or because the, uh, the user selected it from, uh, from the home screen or the app switcher. And then when you hit, hit the back button, you just get back whatever else was, was in there. So it's a true stack of all of the various uh, <laughs> activities. <coughs> and that stack could at some point grow. And so one of these days, we should learn how to not contribute to that. All right, so today I have a short lecture because we have to so, so much catch up to do with the labs. And I want to talk about two things that are important. Um, <coughs> first of all, lists, and then parsing XML. Um, so lists are. Um, whenever you have a, a lot of information that users select something from, you put them in a list. And it's kind of the prototypical data structure that you have on these devices. Um, so think of the, your contact list that you have you know, hundreds of contacts and you scroll through them by just making the finger movement. And it's uh, <coughs> at, f at first to someone who programs from uh, Windows or the web, it's unintuitive that one would do that. Because in, uh, in a Windows application or in a, on a web application, you would not put a few hundred items into uh, a list that the user has to go through. Just imagine that if you had a list of a few hundred items and it was like a drop-down list on, in, a, in a web application, the user could never, I mean, what, what would they do? Right? Every once in a while someone tries, right, with a country, uh, when, you, uh, <coughs> when you have to select a country and you know how hateful it is to have to go through these long things, particularly on the map. Um, and <coughs> but on a, on a device, um, it's actually quite easy because you can, with the fingers, you can scroll th through them pretty quickly. Well, um, later, or some of you yeah. will later find out in your re in your project research how to do more widgets for it. There's a way uh, that you can put <coughs> uh, that you can select like which letter you want to go to and stuff. And so this and the infinite number of add-on decorations that you can do to the list control. But the basic list control, you just put a whole bunch of things in, into this long list um, <coughs> and rely on the, the user to just swipe through that with a finger. And it's a little bit complicated uh, to set it up. Um, you put a list view into the, into the main XML of the activity. And then that list view uh, gets a separate view for the item. Now, that item could be very simple. It could just be a string. But many times you have these list views where each of the items is a little bit more complicated. In, an, in an, uh, a contact application, you might have the name in large letters, the phone number in small letters, or the main phone number, and then a, uh, and then a, a photo on the left, say. And so uh, then you make a separate view for each item. 
um, or for the item that gets being replicated. And now you <coughs> there's two different issues. One is how do you get the data into each of the list rows and then how, how do they get displayed? And so there's a thing called an adapter to populate that and we'll see that on the next slide. Um, <coughs> and add, uh, dealing with events is actually simple. Um, you add an on item click listener and that gets notified whenever the, the user taps an item. The user doesn't click anymore. I guess in, in the old, old days when people had like trackballs and stuff, the user actually clicked. Nowadays they just tap. So this would, this should be called an on item tap listener, but there you go. So uh, that gets notified when the user picks on one of them and you get to know the index of the item that was selected and that's what, what you want. And <coughs> so, so you, Um, you want to override this, this particular method, and so what you care about here is this, this position. You'll see that in the line. Okay, so now this uh, more vexing issue, how do you display stuff? So <coughs> um, let's first of all do the simplest case, which is the one that you're going to be doing today, where you have a list of strings that you want to display. In that case, life is actually very easy. You use an, uh, an array adapter. The array adapter takes a, um, takes a parameter here. And so that's the type of things that you want to display. Um, in, our, in this case here, where we just want to show strings, it's, it's a string. But later on, we'll uh, let, let's oh, go back to the calendar application or the the, uh, the address book application. You might then have an, a new array adapter of person, and then a person would have an image, a name, and a phone number, and then <coughs> you would want to access the, these objects in in this method down here. So right now, strings are simple. Now, <coughs> then you give the array of strings or the array list of strings. It can be any collection of strings as the third parameter. And the second parameter is the ID that points to a single text view. And then that text view is used to display your strings. You still have to make it. It's a little silly. So um, you'll see in the in the lab, you'll have a, a one of those XML files that just contains a text view. Now, what if you have a more complicated situation? Then you have to override the get view method. The job of the get view method is to produce a view that contains all of the information that you want to have displayed. So you have a, a, a simple a, a situation where I have an array of items, and each item has a text, uh, a description text, and it has a price. And I just want to show the description and the price. So somehow I have a view that contains uh, inside it two text views. Uh, with, with these IDs. <coughs> For the reasons that I don't quite understand is that you have to, inf uh, you're given the view, and this one, it may be uh, null, or it may not be null, um, because it likes to reuse views as you're scrolling. So apparently, sometimes it already has enough of them, and it gives you one that is already that was previously created, and you have to be prepared for that. It might not have one, in which case you have to create it with this bunch of number, uh, mumbo jumbo. I'm not entirely sure what it means to inflate, but I think what it means is to get the XML and turn it into a view. <coughs> and uh, so either way, you, uh, you get the view that you don't want to populate. Now, um, the items.get method, um, oh, uh, here, this might, no, it's fine. Um, what the heck is items? Um, the items are wrong. It should be get items. And then the method get item that will get you the particular item that you want from the position. And because it's typed, uh, yeah, in this case, I would have an array adapter of product or of item, I guess. Let me call this product because otherwise it seems very generic. And I'll fix this slide later. <coughs> so you would now have an array adapter of product. This one gives you the particular product. And then you can execute its methods. All right, so that's how you make the view. And this way you could, as you can imagine, make any view you want. You just have to lay out in the usual way. You could have like an image on the left, and stuff on the right, more stuff uh, in, in a different font below it, and so on. Um, you'll need that in uh, the second homework assignment where I'm asking you to uh, show a list of questions for a quiz. And the, uh, the questions that have been answered correctly should show up in green, and the answers that should sh were incorrect should show up in red. And so this is the place where uh, you need to make that modification.
Okay, the next topic that I want to cover very briefly is XML parsing. So, <coughs> essentially all interesting uh, applications on the phone, except for uh, maybe simple games, communicate with the server in some way, and one needs to send data back and forth between the client and the server. And we've used simple text so far, uh, you know, just uh, a file with a bunch of strings, but as you can imagine, when the data structures that you need to communicate back and forth get more complicated, simple text isn't really going to cut it, and one has to have some kind of a way of uh, showing relationships between the items that, that get transported. And that's not a wheel one wants to reinvent, one wants to use some standard format for such. And there are two standard formats that uh, are generally used, either XML or JSON, and both of them have pros and cons. Um, I'm using XML here because, for one thing, that's what's used in the CineQuest project, and also it's just a little bit more general than JSON, it can do a few more things. And it's not really all that much harder. Um, on the other hand, if you're, <coughs> so JSON I think is a better match if you're already writing stuff in JavaScript, and uh, then you don't have to do that extra parsing step. But we'll, we'll just parse it, it's not that hard. So that's the refresher on XML. Um, XML uh, is, <coughs> an XML document, as it's called, is, contains a root element, and each element has, can have attributes. So here is an example of an attribute. I'm using HTML here as an example, so that's something that you're familiar with. Um, an element can contain text and, and child elements. Um, <coughs> so here I have an element that contains text, and here I have an element that the UNFL element that contains this child element and that other child element. You, you're familiar with uh, the start and end tags that delimit the scope of an element. And so the end tags have, us <coughs> have been made so that and one can easily see what the matching start tag is. It's a little verbose, but um, there's plenty of tools that produce it, um, <coughs> and it's, uh, it's just ubiquitous. Now, uh, when you get an XML file, or an X, uh, just a bunch of XML from the server, you have to uh, translate it into something that you can work with, so you have to parse out the XML for the data that's in there. Um, so unhappily, there are three different ways of doing that parsing, and one has to pick one. Um, <coughs> the, the SAX parser, that's, which we will cover here, is the most primitive, but it's fast and uh, it, it's ubiquitous. Um, DOM will build, it's probably the most natural parser for, for someone to use. It will first build a tree, um, just like you've seen in, in maybe a, a programming languages or a compiler course. It will build the whole parse tree of the document. And that's a little inefficient uh, for most applications because if you don't modify that tree in any way, building the tree chews up a bunch of memory that quickly has to get uh, be deallocated again. And it's probably not really worth it. So it's not something that's typically done in mobile applications. And then there's a pull parser that kind of tries to be a little bit more user-friendly than the SACS parser. The SACS parser is event-driven. That means you have to provide a handler that reacts to whenever the parser sees something. And any time that you write anything that's event-driven, it's a little bit tedious because you're not in control. You're just being called. And so this, this inversion of control makes, uh, makes it just a little tedious. So they have a pull parser where instead you can say, give me the next token, give me the next token, give me the next token, and then your application has to uh, process them. As if you were reading a stream of tokens from, uh, from an uh, input. So and <coughs> the Android uh, people recommend that you use the pull parser. And that's not a really a bad recommendation. The only reason I'm not doing it is that it's not as easily testable outside the phone because it's, a, it's specific to Android. They picked some third party pull parser library and uh, baked it into Android. And it's not a part of standard Java, whereas the SAX parser is part of standard Java. And that way you can, you can write and debug your parsing outside the device. Because as I'm sure you will have noticed already in the first homework, and as you will notice in the next few weeks, debugging in the device is no fun. It's slow and it's tedious. And uh, anything that you can do to do testing outside the device is a win. So for that reason, I uh, decided that we'll just stick with SAPs and warts and all, uh, because it does, does make it possible for you to write and test the parsers outside. And that'll be part of what we'll do in the next uh, week or two, that we'll set up a bit of a testing infrastructure. All right, so, SACS, <coughs> you 
set up a handler, you set up callbacks that are being called whenever the parser sees a start element, an end element, or uh, characters that come a bit between them. Now, unfortunately, characters can be called multiple times. It's not the most user-friendly library. So it could happen that you have a, a description, let's say you have a title for, uh, for a question, and it has a bunch of text in here. Then it could happen that this part of the text gets parsed. Maybe there's a new line in there, say. And then this part of the text gets parsed. You get two callbacks uh, in this callback, uh, one after another. And then you're responsible for stringing them together. Um, <coughs> so I made a very simple convenience class. Oops, and the link is broken. Um, here it is. No. OK, I'll have to fix the link. Um, that's it. All it does is um, it sticks any call of characters into, uh, into a string uh, buffer and it uh, gives you a method to retrieve them all at once. OK, I'll <coughs> So here's what you do for your own parser. Now we'll see an example in the next slide. You subclass that thing that I give you. And you add fields for whatever you want to collect. Um, and <coughs> unfortunately, um, you have to now put sometimes code in start element and sometimes an end element. Generally, end element is your friend. For example, when we have this, um, let me just show you an actual XML file. Where do I have it? Here. <coughs> so think of how you're going to parse something like this. So you have a question, and you have four choices. Um, when you see the start text here, you know that really doesn't tell you anything yet, because you haven't yet seen the string here. But when you see the end here, then you can say, great, get, let's look up the text that has accumulated, and let's make that the text of the question. And so you definitely want to have an end handler for text. Similarly, with the choices here, when you see the end of choice, then you say, OK, fine, I'll stick whatever the previous text was into the list of choices. So your end handler is going to say, if I see text, then let the previous string becomes the text of the question. When I see the end of choice, the previous text gets added to the list of choices. And when I see this last question, there's nothing particular that you have to do. You can ignore that. Um, remember, you don't have to do any error handling. You can rely on the fact that someone produced syntactically correct XML. It's not your job to, to improve the world and check the validity of that. Um, all you have to do is uh, take out the data and put them into a domain object. So the only reason that you might need to look at a start tag is here you have an attribute, and the attributes don't get reported with the end tags. So now you're in a bit of an unhappy situation that you now have to say, OK, I don't yet know what that option is going to be. And depending on how your API is, you may still have to, to temporarily stick this in some memory. So then you make an instance variable inside your, uh, inside your handler. Um, set that instance variable, and then you pick up that value again when you come to the end tab. So that's the difficulty with building a SACS parser, that you have to sometimes remember things for a short amount of time. So the job of a SACS parser designer is to figure out how you can receive these bits and pieces and stick them in the object or objects that you're building. So we'll see an example of that in just a minute. And that's here. Can I say anything else I want to say here? No. So this is, in fact, the handler for exactly for the, the XML that you just saw. So <coughs> uh, we have a question class. And that's the, the question class that you've seen before. Um, text string, list of choices, and an integer in, in identifying the correct choice. This is my read from XML method. It takes an input stream. At the bottom of it, it does some mumbo jumbo to make this one into a parser. Um, and it's unbelievable the kind of nonsense that you have to do to get a parser 
Um, and this is a scourge of uh, all of these XML libraries that are written in glorious generality that you have to have a factory that makes parsers. And then you have to ask the factory to please give you a parser and then you can use it. It could be worse. I've seen an API where you have to get a configuration object in order to get a factory. Um, so here it's this, this process. I just copied and pasted that. Once you have the parser, then you give it the stream and the handler. So the handler is where all the action is. Then the other thing that's always horrible with XML uh, parsing is that these things throw three different kinds of exception that don't have a common root exception. And so I turn them all into an IO exception. That way it becomes more manageable. Otherwise, you have to deal with three different exception types, and that's unpleasant. Um, so you can actually get a parser configuration exception if this method here, which you had no earthly interest in the first place, throws an exception, which it can't possibly on, on, on an embedded device. Anyway, that's, that's the API. Um, <clears throat> so when we look at the end element, you see what I just said. Um, when uh, we see text element, then we take the last string. This is the method that uh, grabs the accumulated uh, text that was inside the previous element and, and set it to the text. Now, if you look carefully here, you see that this is a little bit cleverly done. This here is a nested class inside the question class and therefore it has access to the instance variables of the surrounding question. And so if I first construct this object, a question object, then these things become the default. Then I call the read from XML method. Then I, uh, I can just directly set these text fields. Otherwise, it gets a little bit more complicated if you, if you don't do that embedding trick. But uh, you would just have to call methods on the object that you want to build up. Um, so if I have a choice, then I add the last string to the list of choices to this list over here. And finally, I have to deal with the case that th th this value attribute, the one that says value equals true, was set to in fact true. And in that case, I remember the correct choice. Here, the way I can remember is I don't have to keep a counter. Sometimes you have to have to keep a counter. Um, but in this case, I am not out because I can just take the size of the accumulated choices so forth. If I already have two choices, and now I get to see. so. So I had a choice, and I had another choice, and now I get to see the third choice, and it starts out with choice value equals true, then what, what I'm going to read next, that's going to be the correct answer, and I want to have the correct, in, the correct choice index to be 0, 1, 2, and if you look at it, I already have two elements in my array list. I have not yet added that one in, so that's the one. Um, and that's the parcel. So it's, it's a little backwards, but it's, it's not a lot of effort in terms of actually programming. All right, that's all I have. So with the lab, um, we, we should just go back to lab three and pick up there from page two. And then when, uh, if you have time today or more quite, quite a bit more likely on next Tuesday, you should then finish, uh, finish up this lab where you get to make a list of choices uh, <coughs> and so instead of having the four buttons, we'll just dump them in a list. It's not a great application for a list maybe because it's such a short list, but still it shows the, the basic mecha me mechanics. And then I want you to, to put in that parser and I have a few questions about the code of the parser that makes you read through it. So when you get going with uh, picking up from lab three right now, and then I'll fix up the bug in the slides that you, so that you can get that, that basic handler stuff. <coughs>